He's been going back and forth to see a gallery. And if you ever traveled a lot, you know that going back and forth from one place to the other, with people demanding things of you everywhere that you are, that you must find a place of peace. Mm -hmm. And if one does not do that, one's health is affected. We become tired and fatigued. Our eyes grow dim. We're unable to focus, either with our eyes or even our attention. We are so tired we just want people to leave us alone. You ever been there? For me, it's usually on Sunday. <laughs> no, Jesus. Jesus goes to Tyre. And he goes into a house. He's not saying it, but he is acting it out. I need to be resting. I need to be left alone. But when God begins a ministry in you, there is never any time in which you have the opportunity to rest. Even when your body is so tired, you can barely move. The reality of that is, is that you're not doing it on your own. When God calls you into ministry, even when you're fatigued, tired, or maybe even just mean and mad. Somehow the Holy Spirit speaks to our spirit, comforts, relieves, empowers to do things that we never thought we could ever do on our own. Been there? So Jesus was fatigued. He's tired. He goes into a house thinking, can I just be with the Father alone for a little bit? More than lucky, before he could even be seated on a chair inside the house, there's people clamoring, needing him. Because when your need is so great, nothing will stop you from having it met. You know, my belief is if the disciples were standing out there outside the door and this woman wanted to get to Jesus to save her daughter, that those boys are not big enough to stop that woman. Her spirit was desperate to find help in the truth. She had heard about this itinerant Nazarene preacher. How she did, one does not know. She was of Syrian Phoenician origin. And being a Phoenician, she comes from a warrior background. This was one time. She loved her child so much that no matter what the culture said, what people said, she was going to go to the source of power and healing no matter what price she had to pay for her child. Can you imagine a mother that has a child, either a demonic possession or extreme, psychiatric needs. You know what the culture wants to do with those type of folk, don't you? Ban them. They are unclean. We don't even want to feed them or house them. We want them out of our sight because it makes us uncomfortable to see people that are not like us. And especially people who have such needs. And because I don't understand the truth about the heart and the mind. And that the child was created in the image of God. And that God loves that child. How can we know? She pushes through all the obstacles. Jesus is speaking to her, her in a way to encourage her to have faith and trust. Don't let these barriers stop you. Don't even let my words stop you. But sir, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs under the children's table. That's desperation, isn't it? Her desperation, her willingness to pursue the calling of help for her child and her belief in this man, Jesus, 
that every obstacle was moved out of its way and she was going to, as we say, appropriate power that it was there for her if she would just have faith. Man, instantly, instantly, the child is free. That's the miracle. Miracles do happen. Oh, listen, they even happen in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Seen it with my own eyes, believe mm -hmm. 35 years of being a priest and being a pastor and being in hospitals and being in critical care, I've seen miracles of God. When everyone else had given up on them or that child, except many times the faith and the love of the mother. Faith has power. It's not ours. It's not our intellectual prowess. It is the truth of the scriptures. It is the power of God who chooses to show us his presence, his power, and his love in ways that are beyond our rational understanding. Later on, he, he runs into a man who has been deaf and mute. That's pretty common, isn't it, for deaf people? The crowds came and pressed on him. He's trying to get some rest. The rest for those who follow the Lord is scant. His spittle gets in the ears of his man. into his father and the spirit heals the man and he regains his hearing and he's able to speak what a miracle I talk about this because I want to share an experience that I have had in regards to that now you're going to leave here today saying father Richard just lost his mind <laughs> Let me spray on that. <laughs> About 15 years ago, I was called to, to work with another priest uh, near Panama City, Florida. And on this mission, I had, had about 40 kids that traveled with me. We had a guitarist and a couple other musicians who were with us. That guitarist, by the way, is the dean of the cathedral in Asheville. John Todd Donatello. And we went into this little church and there was a healing service going on. I believed in spiritual healing. I believed that God could heal. But he had to do it through somebody like Bill Graham. <laughs> a man of God. I'm just a priest. man comes up to me and he is deaf his wife was with him and she said he had lost his hearing a number of years ago but he was a professor of psychology in one of the universities there on the coast junior college I think the time for prayers came The altar rail was full of people, and there are other clergy there laying hands on people and anointing them with oil, and people were celebrating the joy of the Lord. This doctor comes and kneels before me, and I'm surrounded by two acolytes. He looked at me in his eyes, and he says, Do you have faith enough to pray for me? Ooh. I said, I rely only on the Lord Jesus Christ. I have no power in of myself. He says, I believe today that God will use you as an instrument of healing and peace in my life. I'm going to pay What if the Lord's not with me? What if I'm unworthy? I am a sinful man. 
but I was willing to be used at that moment and I laid my hands on top of this man and I felt like my hands were on fire. I wanted a fire extinguisher on him. I'm an angry man after all. God is my witness. As I prayed on this man, I heard two pops. And with my own hearing and my own eyesight, he received his hearing in that Episcopal church. <laughs> <laughs> that had a profound effect on me as an Anglican, especially a conservative Anglican. And that time, an intellectual snob. That changed everything about my belief. It showed me that no matter what the situation, God is able to use you even when you're just a crazy rural mission priest. And that you don't have to be a Billy Graham, and you don't have to be a super spiritual person, you just have to be willing to allow God to use you in other people's lives. The goosebumps all over my body. Now, does that make me special? No. I'm just a Christian. That's all. Just like the heat of you. I've told you about Bishop Judson Child of Atlanta. And I had known him for years, and he had a lot to do with, uh, with my son when my son was ill with uh, alpha one antitrypsin deficiency, liver disease. And Judson and I were we're talking, he was then the Bishop of Atlanta, and I talked to him in, as a time of confirmation. And I said, Bishop, what do you expect when you lay hands on people? He says, what does the scripture say? It's like it was an exam. Well, the scripture say that if we believe, and we will allow the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, all the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit. That's correct. I said, what do you expect, Bishop, when you lay hands on people? He says, I expect them to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a mature Christian witness in the world and have the power of the apostles. I was like, whoa. Man, what a responsibility as an Episcopalian in our confirmation that we're to use that right and that empowerment that sign of maturity to do ministry in the world and be empowered by the Spirit to do things that will just absolutely fascinate the world. My friends, the world does not believe. The world believes only in itself. And it worships at the altar of me. Christians have a great responsibility in the beginning of this 21st century to take their faith seriously. <laughs> As my friend Michael said, he, had, he was an Episcopal priest, so was his wife, and they were, their ministry was in Harlem, and he wrote a book that was called So Long, Sweet Jesus. The sweet Jesus of the 40s and 50s, when religion was booming right after World War II. The churches were full. And Michael was saying, that is wonderful. But the people who are sitting in those pews have been called by their baptism to ministry. And will they do that in the name of Jesus Christ? Will they act as though they are Christians in the world? He had a tremendous ministry. Michael would say it's never me. So Michael, when you teach and preach in this small, poor parish, what do you say? He says, I don't know. I just open my mouth and expect God the Holy Spirit to speak through me. I try to get out of the way of God's action in the world. It's hard to be Christian in the world. 
And the reason it becomes hard to be Christian in the world is because many of us as Christians believe that we are powerless to face the world as it is. We are empowered by a God who has empowered us to such an extent that even the enemy has to stop in the name of Jesus. We're, we're powerful people. If the culture is going to change in the 21st century, especially in the United States and in the church, we have to act like we believe that it is possible to change the world. One person at a time. Not a dozen at a time. One person at a time, face to face, sharing the gospel as we understand it, using the language that we understand and feel comfortable with, but more importantly, as we share, we love. We don't make decisions about people based upon how tall, how short, tiny or big, black or white, religious or not religious, Christian or non-Christian. <laughs> We've been called by God to act in the world in a way that the church has not been called since the time of the medieval church. The church in America is, is on the verge of extinction. The churches are declining in membership. And when you ask those who have left the church, they say the church has nothing to offer me. And my response to that is, what do you have to offer it? So the big question, the final question, is why are we here? Honestly, for me personally, if I didn't believe and believe that God could use me, I'd be playing golf. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why waste my time here confessing something that I don't believe? How about religious honesty? Saying, why am I here? What does God want to teach me? What part of my life does God want to heal because I'm here in this community of faith? And stop hiding from each other. Bring the gospel to bear in all of our relationships, in all of our circumstances, and to trust God first, not last. Go to God first, not last, and be an expected people. And God will change the world through you. In the name of God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.